Hello and welcome. I'm Alison Markin Powell, Japanese literary translator and former co chair of the Pen Translation Committee. My co host today is Tess Lewis, who many of you will recognize from our Week 12 program on ghost languages of Europe. Tess is an award winning translator from French and German, also a former co chair of the Pen Translation Committee, as well as a co organizer of Translating the Future, the conference you are now attending. Thank you, Allison, and thanks to all of you for joining us for the 16th installment of our weekly program, Language as Polis. Language, as all of you know in your bones, is at the core of our identities, personal as well as political. One symptom of the recent fraying of the American polis is the increasing hostility directed at people speaking languages other than English in public and in the sustained resistance to bilingual education. Today's panelists will discuss three languages that have been threatened by this urge to containment and simplification, but have also developed strength and resilience in encountering this threat. Yiddish, Catalan, and Frisian are languages without passports. Each one has a complex history of accommodating, absorbing, and influencing the dominant official languages of their particular regions. And all three are object lessons in the richness and value of linguistic inclusiveness and diversity. Today's conversation will feature Madeline Cohn, also known as Mindel, who is academic director of the Yiddish Book Center in Amherst, Massachusetts, which is sponsoring today's program. Latasha Diggs, a writer, vocalist, and sound artist based in, is based in Harlem, and Marianne Newman, translator from Catalan and Spanish, and the force behind the San Jordi New York Festival. You can find out more about these three wonderful people and their illustrious achievements on the Center for Humanities website. Today's conversation is also sponsored by the Institut Ramon Yur. A Q&A session will follow today's talk as usual. Please email your questions for Mindel, Latasha, and Marianne to translatingthefuture2020 at gmail.com. We'll keep questions anonymous unless you note in your email that you would like us to read your name. Translating the Future will continue in its current form through September. During the conference's originally planned dates in late September, several marvelous larger scale events will happen. Until then, we'll be here every Tuesday with the week's hour long conversation. Please join us next Tuesday, September 1st for so-called classics with Laurie Patton, Gopal Sukhu, and Vivek Narayanan. And keep checking the Center for the Humanities site for future events. Translating the Future is convened by PEN America's Translation Committee, which advocates on behalf of literary translators working to foster a wider understanding of their art and offering professional resources for translators, publishers, critics, bloggers, and others with an interest in international literature. The committee is currently co-chaired by Lynn miller Lachlan and Larissa Kaiser. For more information, look for translation resources at pen.org. And if you know anyone who was unable to join us for the live stream today, a recording will be available afterward on the HowlRound and Center for the Humanities sites. Before we turn it over to Mindel, Latasha, and Marianne, we'd like to offer our utmost gratitude to today's sponsors, the Institut Ramon Yur and the Yiddish Book Center, and to our partners at the Center for the Humanities at the Graduate Center CUNY, the Martin E. Siegel Theater Center, the Coleman Center for Scholars and Writers at the New York Public Library, PEN America, and to the masters of dark Zoom magic at HowlRound who make this live stream possible. And now to our speakers. Hello. Hi. Hi, Marianne. Hi, Latasha. Hi, Mendel. Hi, Latasha. Hello. So we had the idea to start by, you know, each of us introducing ourselves and, and saying a bit about our relationship to these language and I think some first thoughts kind of in response to the theme. Um, I'm willing to be the guinea pig and go first if that sounds good to folks. That sounds great, Linda, thanks. <laughs> okay, I'm um, really excited to get to be here and have this conversation with both of you and, and grateful to the organizers as well. Um, for putting together this amazing session that's brought, you know, a lot of enrichment to my summer, certainly. So it's exciting 
you know, not just for us to get to talk, I think, but to be part of the conversation that's been evolving over the weeks. Um, so a word about me, I'm the academic director at the Yiddish Book Center, which is a nonprofit organization in Massachusetts. Um, it, we're celebrating our 40th anniversary this year and the mission of the organization has been originally to physically save Yiddish books. Um, and then in the decades since, you know, to interpret that mission in a lot of different ways of what does it mean to help make Yiddish accessible to different people. So first by making the books accessible, but then through different in educational work um, to make Yiddish culture and Yiddish literature accessible. Um, and I'll say a bit more about that probably later. We talk about some of the practical work um, that is happening to support Yiddish in translation. I didn't grow up speaking Yiddish. I learned it as an adult. Um, I had one grandparent um, with whom I was very close who was a Yiddish speaker, but I started studying it in college um, after learning German and, and getting really interested just in the, the Jewish experience and the Jewish role in, in modern European and modern world history and trying to understand you know, how this um, diasporic and stateless people continue to play such an influential role in, um, in world events, especially European and Western history. And my experience, once I started learning Yiddish, I think is the same for many people who learn it. it it's like opening a door into a secret room of treasure that one didn't even know that the room existed and suddenly one discovers these great riches that um, speak to so many aspects of, of modern historical experience and and to being in the world today in a lot of different ways. So um, I went to graduate school studying Yiddish literature and I've taught Yiddish language, especially to beginners. And I would say I've done just a lot of teaching that's about, um, about trying to introduce Yiddish to people. It's a language that has a lot of symbolic weight. It means a lot of things to different people and people have strong ideas about Yiddish. And I find it really rewarding um, to open up the different complexities of language for people who have never encountered it before or have strong associations with it, but um, there's so much more to learn about any culture and, and this culture for sure. Um, and the last thing I'll say is a lot of my work recently has been in support of um, Yiddish and translation and more than even my own translation, I've done a lot of work as a translation editor, which I really love. Um, I was the translation editor for an online journal called Ingeweb, and at the Yiddish Book Center, I get to do a lot of editing of, of Yiddish translations as well. Um, so I'll, I'll make my pitch for why translation is so important to, um, to languages like Yiddish, languages without state support, languages that are kind of, um, that are threatened in different ways or, or just depend, I guess, on, on communities of, of individuals to, to maintain them. Um, so I'll say a few things about, about Yiddish in response to the, the theme of language as polis or the idea of language as polis. We had started talking about stateless languages when we started speaking about this session. And I'm really interested that we shifted to this idea of thinking about, you know, how languages organize community, how languages give shape to community, especially outside of, um, the structures of nation or state. Because I think probably that actually does describe the condition for many more languages and speakers than does the state of speaking a national language, right? The, the fact that I grew up speaking English in the United States is really probably an exception um, for, hum for most human experience rather than the norm, though it's presented that way, right? To be a monolingual speaker of a national language is is thought of as some kind of normal condition. And it's probably not. Um, whereas, you know, Yiddish speakers who were by definition multilingual and interacting using different languages for different parts of their lives without any kind of um, representation by their government is, is true for a lot of people in the world today and throughout history. So I like that if we take that framework, you know, how do we understand a relationship between language and and communal identity differently than the idea of, you know, 
English in England and France, French in France and German in Germany. Um, I thought it was, you know, there, there is a, a centuries long history of um, Jews turning to Yiddish to help organize their sense of community. So probably we would say, you know, in the 19th century in response to or in communication with the rise of romantic nationalism in Europe, which meant for many different peoples and languages, you know, turning to their vernacular language to build up a, a national culture. That happened for Jews in that time period as well. Some people turned to Hebrew and, and that's very much how we get um, the revival of the modern Hebrew language and, and Zionism. And at the same time, different people were turning to Yiddish um, to redefine a sense of what it meant to be Jewish people or the Jewish nation. And in many ways, this kind of movement to build a Yiddish national culture was really very successful. You know, the, there are tens of thousands of volumes of Yiddish literature in the Yiddish Book Center in Amherst, and they are largely a product of this conscious ideological movement to build a Yiddish national culture, to create everything in Yiddish that Jews saw as defining national culture around them, literature and poetry and theater and scholarship and educational systems. Probably the biggest, the biggest difference for this Yiddish national movement compared to the other movements in Europe at the time, maybe two differences, right, was the kind of persistent otherness of Jews as, as non-Christians in Europe and their lack of a territory, their lack of a national territory in Europe. So, you know, while there is a lot in common, say, between how, what Polish literature was doing in the 19th century as part of the movement to put Poland back on the map to reestablish a Polish nation and a Polish culture, um, Yiddish hadn't been on the map before the way that Poland had. So the, the idea of creating an, a Yiddish state was something that some people were interested in, but um, I think much more widespread was just a desire for national cultural recognition, national cultural autonomy, um, and that there be some recognition by the states where Jews lived in their collective identity and their collective rights beyond just their individual rights to exist in those states. Obviously all of that changes for Yiddish, you know, in the, in the second half of the 20th century that um, all of these efforts to kind of build Yiddish national culture are really dramatically interrupted by the Holocaust and the death of so many of its speakers. And then the, the failure to reestablish, you know, centers of, of Yiddish in Europe um, and then different forms of suppression, you know, both by Yiddish speakers out of fear of continued anti-Semitism. Um, by suppression in the Soviet Union, which you know earlier had supported Yiddish as a as a minor national language and later did not. Um, in Israel, Yiddish really didn't receive support support because the project was to build Hebrew as the national language. And you know, in places like the United States, the pressure to assimilate or Americanize um, disrupted Yiddish's continuity which is not to say that it hasn't continued, it does survive. It's very much a, a living language, especially in Hasidic communities around the world today. Um, but yeah, this, the, the question of how, to, how a community can support its, its language has continued for Yiddish and has become more, more challenging, or as there are new challenges, right? Given that it's no longer the majority daily spoken language of Ashkenazi Jews as it was in the first half of the 20th century. And yet nevertheless, you know, I'm part of this community of people that, that continues to turn to Yiddish and continues to think it's important um, in our lives today and has things to say to us today. And I certainly think that translating Yiddish literature from that period is, is one important way to kind of maintain this community and, and maintain continuity um, but I'll say more about that later and let um, Natasha and Marianne introduce themselves. I think we were going in alphabetical order, Natasha. Would you like to continue? Oh, oh. 
Well, uh, first, I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me um, to this conversation regarding uh, stateless languages and languages polis. Um, I'll first say that um, I am a poet and a performer who plays with language. Um, I have fun with language. I get frustrated with language, multiple languages. Um, and for anyone who is familiar with my work, um, I work with several different languages often um, all at the same time, um, kind of making a bit of a collage with them based on sound and meaning. And as part of this conversation, it, 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 it arises at a, a curious invitation in 2018. Um, the organization, the Flemish House uh, de Buren, invited me to come to Leeuwarden. Leeuwarden is in the north of Netherlands, um, also considered the capital of Friesland, um, for two weeks just to write about Leeuwarden. I had no idea how these uh, folks knew of me and why they wanted me to come and visit Leeuwarden. And, and I just said, yeah, okay, sure. <laughs> and, and so for two weeks, I was in, I was in Leeuwarden and wandering about, wondering what am I supposed to write about? And this also came at the time that um, Leeuwarden as well as Valenta, which is a city in Malta, were uh, deemed, given the title, the European Capital of Culture for the year 2018, which is something that all of the European countries participate in, something that was established back in 1985. And so Leeuwarden being the cultural capital of Europe was a big deal. So there were all of these activities. One, one had to do with creating this hall of languages where they created an installation with some uh, 6,000 plus languages that are still spoken um, throughout the world. There were a couple of languages that I was looking for that were not in that hall that I do know are spoken, but that's a conversation for later as to whether or not there are languages versus pigeons versus dialects. Um, but that's for something else. And as I'm wondering, wandering about, um, I come to this center called Afuk. And our focus, the official center for the Frisian language. And I'm going, what's Frisian? <laughs> and, um, and so I, you know, I learn rather in, in pieces that, you know, Frisian is the language that was spoken by the Frisians in Friesland, which was once its own kingdom before it became part of the Netherlands and that it has a mythical uh, route to India, um, but that's not so much the case. It's, it has a Germanic root, it has a Latin root. Um, it's related to English. Um, but that um, for one moment, um, it was a language it is a language that is considered a minority language as well as an indigenous language. Um, aside from it being the second official language spoken in the Netherlands. So I went on a, a walkabout attempting to learn the language, which uh, presented challenges because in Leeuwarden, I came across very few people that spoke Friesland, 
um, despite the fact that there's a center dedicated to the uh, preservation of the language, that the language is um, supported by the government, yet at the same time, uh, it appeared to me in my observations, uh, a not, uh, not so much of a, a widespread interest in learning the language aside from maybe a, another minority language in another remote town somewhere in the world uh, with linguists there interested in doing some type of collaboration. Um, but again, these were very, very remote places. And, and so I decided to write about my attempts to learn Frisian and um, my attempts to learn what Frisian identity is um, in a place where you weren't, you were not hearing Frisian, but you were seeing it um, either displayed on the streets, the literal streets, displayed as window displays, um, displayed on top of buildings. Um, and yet nothing was audible, you couldn't hear it. And for me, as someone who works with sound, and this is how I play with language, um, it became a task um, of trying to find someone who spoke it and would take me seriously enough as a foreigner, um, as a brown foreigner, <laughs> who was curious about the language. Um, and, um, you know, I'll wait to read some of the work a little bit later, but how it relates to, kind of connects to this um, question of translation. I myself am not a translator, um, but the task of then translating my work to Frisian uh, exposed to me um, just how much or how little uh, there are those of a younger generation. And I may be completely wrong right now because um, that was two years ago. So maybe there is someone who has picked up the mantle. Um, of, of serving as a translator of a English-based work to Frisian. And I say English-based despite the fact that within the text that I wrote, Frisian does emerge, Dutch does emerge. Um, Suriname Tongo, which is a, a language that is uh, more based in Suriname, but it has its uh, um, it has a connection to the Dutch because Suriname was once a colony of um, the Netherlands. Um, to, to critique and rather to critique this notion of Friesland being a multilingual uh, location um, that uh, that within the landscape that I was navigating, coming across brown bodies, uh, whether they be Egyptian, whether they be um, from another country in Africa, whether they be from some area in Asia, uh, the inability to hear their language um, in a place that doesn't appear to encourage um, languages from uh, other, other places outside of Europe to be heard. Um, and that multilingual for them, which was 
surprising to me because when I think of multilingual, I think of brown. <laughs> I think of variations of brown. I think of variations of black. I think of variations of beige. I don't think uh, particularly as someone visiting a place with my body, multilingual being just Frisian and Dutch. Mm -hmm. You know, especially when I'm encountering um, a Somalian body who wants to engage me in Dutch, mm -hmm. but I don't know Dutch, mm -hmm. you know, and, and yet it, it doesn't appear that it doesn't appear that that body wants to then switch to maybe the language that of their origin, right? <laughs> that they're going to continue to try to speak in a European language until I until I can understand them. And it was like so it's like hmm, this is very interesting. Um, and then to encounter Dutch people and to encounter uh, folks who are, whose origins are based in the North, in areas where they are Frisian, um, not interested in Frisian <laughs> as a language and, um, and going, so what is that about? So yeah, and I'll, I'll stop there because I think, um, I think I can serve the conversation a little bit more later as we kind of flush this out. <laughs> <laughs> but that's really interesting, the thing about a kind of erasure though, you know, and, and um, for, for me, language is a, is a very, emo it's both emotional and political. It's both, both of those things from, from the start. And my introduction to Spanish, the first time I ever got on a plane at four years old was to go to Cuba with my parents because my aunt was working there with the CIA. And, um, and so my introduction to Spanish was, I, I had, they taught me 25 words, you know, probably things to eat, leche con chocolate and arroz con pollo and the address my aunt lived at, I suppose, in case I got lost, which was uh, phonetically vinti dos y tres y vedado. <laughs> uh, so that was my start in Spanish. And then I went, you know, I grew up in Chelsea. I grew up in this house and um, Chelsea was a very uh, Hispanic inflected neighborhood. 14th Street was called Little Spain, and it was where all of the emigres and immigrants and migrants came, <clears throat> well, from the 19th century on from Spain. And, and they, um, after, the, after the Civil War, the Republicans came. And then in the 1950s, there was more of an economic exile and a lot of people who were not leftists, but uh, more right-wing came. In any case, I was going to a Catholic school on 17th Street, St. Francis Xavier. And that was a mix, mixture of the children of these um, immigrants and the children of, of Puerto Rican uh, natives. Um, it was a, probably my class was at least a third Hispanic or Spanish as we said in those days. So, but there was a certain, it was my first introduction to diglossia. So my introduction to Spanish is in this incredibly vibrant culture, very exciting, uh, all of these new experiences. And then I come back home and there is a, an, a whole Hispanic pool, but where people are, where the Spanish language is not the strong, it's not as strong as the English language. So, so there's an inequality between the two of them, which is the diglossia uh, that I'm going to refer to, um, at, which is the presence of two languages in an, in an unequal situation. So, um, but from as, you know, as I, as I grew, 
um, Spanish became an observatory from which I could look at English. When I went to college, I started studying Spanish and I studied it in high school. But when I got serious about it, um, it was in the 70s and I was very anti-Yankee, anti-American and Spanish was the place from which I could look at the United States. And then I went to Spain on my junior year abroad, junior semester. And of course, Spain, uh, Frank, it was 1972, Franco hadn't died, Franco was still alive. And Spanish was a, in the position of power. And in fact, in the position of erasure, of trying to erase the Catalan language. So in, in Spain, I, the, the natural place for me to migrate to was, was to Catalan. Aside from the fact that the first time I landed in Barcelona from on the train, um, it was not landing the first time I slid into Barcelona. I just fell in love with it immediately. I mean, the architecture, the landscape. Um, Madrid was a very, <clears throat> the presence of the government and of, the, of, of Franco was very overwhelming. And even though he was no less present in Catalonia and in Barcelona, or even more present in other ways, um, <clears throat> it was, uh, there was more pushback, there was much more resistance, and that was a place where I felt comfortable. So I began to informally to study Catalan and um, and in fact, I've always studied it informally. My, all my Catalan is street Catalan with a whole lot of reading behind it. I never actually took a class. I took two classes at the Catalan Circle in Madrid and they were so terrible that I didn't continue. So I have this um, emotional relationship to language that is also political. Um, the whole question of language as polis I think is really interesting. One of the, the first full length book I translated into Catalan, into English rather, was by Xavier Rubert de Ventos, who was one of the great Catalan philosophers of the 20th century. And he wrote this book as well. Not, I hope you can see it, um, which is a study of nationalisms from a philosophical perspective. And he is um, re responding to a kind of cosmopolitan um, uh, dislike of, of people who are vindicating their, their cultures. You know, why are you so, why is this so important to you? You know what, you, oh, and, and there's, a, there's a rejection on the part of the, of the, of the language of power. Of the, of the less powerful language and in understanding that things would just be so much easier if you would stop doing that, you know? So, um, but one of the things that Chevier says in this book is that Polis, in fact, which is the city, comes to substitute, comes to replace the clan and it replaces the old customs and the, you know, the practices of vengeance and, you know, having to kill the people who have offended your family, et cetera. And you have this more um, civilized uh, relationship to one another. Um, but this requires a certain kind of forgetting. It requires you to forget the old rules. And in some cases, it would require you to forget the language. So um, I think the whole question of polis is, it has a it has a positive and a negative aspect, you know. And I actually um, I like the notion of stateless as well, because Catalonia has everything to have be a state except the state. It has the language, it has an economy, it has you know institutions, it has a constitution of its own from you know many centuries ago from before the Magna Carta. So, you know, that it's, it, it's, it's a country. And with many, with a lot of, um, um, it's very interesting because Catalan, of course, is not spoken only in, 
in Catalonia, it's spoken in the south of France, it's spoken in Valencia and the Balearic Islands, even a little bit of Italy. So um, if it's, it's, it's a stateless language in that sense, because it has many, it has feet in many, in many different places. Um, it's, I'm interested in, in the emergence of Yiddish or the reemergence of Yiddish because it follows a similar, <clears throat> Catalan follows a similar path. Um, in the 19th century, there's a reemergence of Catalan culture. Um, after having been, after the War of Succession in 1714, uh, Catalonia is, is absorbed into uh, the Spanish state by Philip V of Bourbon. And uh, the Catalan universities are closed. They establish a Spanish language university in Cervera, a Jesuit institution. And you know, it takes a century for the Catalans to kind of regroup and and begin again to um, to the in, one of the interesting things I read another another book uh, by Enrico Ma called Castilian: The Language Next Door, and he was talking about the fact that in fact, Catal you know, Catalonia was mostly monolingual for much of its history. I know there are other linguists who say differently, but it's a very convincing thesis. And, um, and in fact, you know, what happens then is that the diglossia becomes class-based, whereas all Catalans speak Catalan, but the Catalans who want to become noble adopt Spanish. And, this, and Spanish institutions are established, uh, the Spanish, language is imposed, in fact, by Philip V and, and his successors. And, uh, but they're not very successful because one of the things that saves Catalan, in fact, is the fact that so many people were uh, illiterate. So they weren't reading, they weren't going to school, and they were continuing to speak Catalan. And in fact, when bishops and um, and generals and other people would come to Catalonia, they would have to speak Catalan in order to be understood. Mm -hmm. So preachers would have to learn to preach in Catalan because otherwise they wouldn't be able to um, spread the word, spread the gospel. That's such an interesting way of like asserting power from a position of what would be seen as powerlessness, right? That like the language being spoken and illiterate forces these people in positions of power to use it. Um, that's right, that's right. And, and the, it's the power of the people. In that case, it's more the, the demos, right? The, the people who haven't forgotten their culture and their language, who haven't chosen to enter the polis, mm -hmm. or haven't chosen or don't have the opportunity. But in any case, they maintain that, that historic memory. Mm -hmm. Anyway, um, I think, I think, um, yeah, I think I can. I could stop there, and we can we can speak to each other. Um, well, and I'm thinking too, uh, just thinking about the time. I know we we each brought some some poetry to read. I wonder if we should do that now to make sure that they all get heard, and then sure, more time to discuss. Does that make sense? Sure, Latasha, would you? We'd love. We'd, I'd love to hear. Start because I think you have some of your own work that you'll share with us. Yeah, um, and. Before I do that, I need to find the link again. Um, it's funny, um, I had, because I wanted to bring up the fact that um, shortly after I left, Leovard and wanted to prevent the arrival of more Antillians, <laughs> which is, you know, an interesting conversation uh, later on. Um, trying to find, okay. Um, will I be able to um, share this? I think so. Share screen. Mm -hmm. So let me do this very quickly. Um, I just want to make sure that. Okay. So can you see the, the mm -hmm. poem? 
Yes. yes. Okay. So. Oompa Loompa? Oompa Loompa. <laughs> uh, soy aquí, Lutang. Can you welcome this gaze towards words unspoken by a cynical generation? Dump some luster of rulers. Your labor deserves plaudits. A pump of blood never explained, just expected. Yours a root I may retain just to slurs. General blah blah is null, so simply we are bipedal, but we be natural idiots. <laughs> full of ourselves driven to control the oceans, the winds, adjectives. Your cheese is mean, friend, like pungyu crunch. But we knew this. Skin fished and fry up. I thought it was the French to blame on mayo. A deaf waitress serves, teaches me espresso. A cashier denies me stamps. Coat the roofs with hot, ya, ital, et mem. No volume raised though. So who hears if unable to read? Does this hand need be this heavy? Elaborate for me this thing about Frisian women. Evidence of heavy unfeathered traits all leading to Famke Janssen. Bad example, so Feholen, Fehalen. The Dutch G is now meal compadre. Relatives not. Coat of honey on Spain or Iraq or insert African Asian root here. Well, then we did duet. A transfer of particles across ponds where escaped we collage. My skin coat switch. Longing tropics it pales beside Bandese. Your oak thrives in sand as I digress to YouTube tutorials to catch the rhythm. Full of joy, alas, the shop for clumpies is open from 12 to five, the tallest in Europe, eh? So what about the Danes? Hung like Groot there? Get yours vertical accents, damn your staircases, scaling obtuse triangles of hell, misdirected retribution for fiending blisco. Dump more tea in a big cup, please. <laughs> I think my Moana, my lessons are this, and I'll read just this one. A Gehia Zumbi after Stan Stanley Brown. O numero total de minhas passos in the Bronx. Watashi no stepo no sosu Harlem. El numero total de mis passos in Helmond. Watashi no stepo no sosu Nishi Ogikubo. O numero total de minhas passos em North Carolina. Watashi no stepo no sosu Okinawa. El numero total de mis passos em São Salvador, je Bahia. Watashi no stepo no sosu Tasco. O numero total de minhas passos em Jalagi. Watashi no stepo no sosu Vandese. El numero total de mis trampos en Ile Yoruba. And I'll stop there. Beautiful. Thank you, Natasha. I, Lovely. Can I ask a question about the second poem that you read? Sure. The um, kind of smaller English text, how does that relate to the, the rest of the text that you read aloud? Because there are some changes, right? But not the same changes as in? Not the same changes. Um, it's the, the total number of my steps in is actually uh, a, uh, a, a straight reference from Stanley Brown. Stanley Brown was a Dutch uh, conceptual artist. And um, uh, the funny thing about his work he dealt with measurements um, and uh, counting how many steps he would take from A to B or asking strangers to make maps. Like, how do you get to this store? You know, and then ask them to draw a map. Um, sometimes they wouldn't know anything. And then he would stamp it, you know, Stanley Brown was here. Um, what 
interested me about Stanley's work was that for most of his career, no one knew his identity because he refused uh, to take photographs of himself. Uh, there would be gallery exhibitions of his work and he wouldn't attend. Um, <laughs> and um, so really nobody knew his identity. His identity was merely these measurements. And, um, um, and then it was much later when he passed away, his wife wanted to make sure that everybody knew that he was black <laughs> um, and that he was uh, originally from Suriname um, when Suriname was um, a, a colony of the Netherlands and that he went to the, um, the Netherlands later in his life to study art. Um, so it's really interesting how then um, in this one uh, conceptual piece that he uh, created, which was about the number of his steps, um, you, you get clues as to what, as to who he may be um, and who he's identifying as, but you're, you're never quite sure. So I wanted it to be a mistranslation of sorts, because, you know, I don't, like, I don't think the, you know, they're, they're, they're 100 percent correct at all, right? Um, but it's, it's me playing with the language, me uh, trying to play with the Dutch and the Spanish and the Japanese to kind of record my identity in this um, very northern um, low country space. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Beautiful. Marianne, do you want to read something? Okay. Um, I think I have. Oh, where is it? You know, I don't have the the the. I don't have the the text I want. I I don't have access to the text I want to share. So. I'm going to have to. I'm going to have to stop that. But I will read it. I, ha I have access to it myself. Um, this is a poem by Joseph Carnet. I am currently working on a um, a book by Carnet called Trees, and it is indeed that. It is just a book about every every poem is about trees, <laughs> and um, and it's it's rhymed. And I have, in general, I don't rhyme. I don't, um, but in this particular case, I don't know why I can't bring the, oh, don't tell me. Come on. Oh. All right. All right. I'm gonna read a little bit in Catalan just so that you feel it. Um, oh, I can't. I, okay, I'm sorry. I've, I'm, I don't know why I can't, I can't get that. But anyway, it's called The Donkey and the Olive Tree. Um, this is a, a poem about trees, as I said, and the ones where you get the real Mediterranean feeling are when he writes about olive trees and fig trees. And there's always this tremendous kind of Old Testament feeling to it and also very Christian. But it's, it's an interesting um, example of how, how all of these religious images are actually part of Catalan culture. I, I mean, I'm sure. In, um, People celebrate holidays, even if they're atheists. People celebrate the landscape and they have, it's part of the language, in other words. It's, it's part of the memory. Um, so here, the donkey and the olive tree. Donkey fixed to the pious olive tree, lenient tree, sentient being. The great tree in its dotage of glee laughs at the house and the dark, darkening stream. The tired donkey neither yearns nor awaits the ancient God crowned in thorns. His brays ring out on the crooked trail like the scraps of Orient mourned. You are the two gifts of the sacred land where the aurora appears in rosy span. O oh, testaments to that lovely bluff. Prophetic beast whom a fool would query. Wholesome tree 
ready to parley. Your silver is the dust of immortal stuff. Okay. And I'm sorry, you can't see the original. I can, I can read a, a tiny bit of the original. L'olivera i l'asa, asa fermata la pia olivera, arbre suau, animal entenent, l'arbre en sa gran velletat juganera, riu a la casa i el negre torrent. Okay. Beautiful. It's beautiful. I like it. It's the first time I've read it out loud, so. <laughs> It's in, pro it's in progress. Any, any comments will be welcome. We'd, we'd love to hear something of yours, uh, Linda, Linda. So, well, you can see now, um, I'm sharing the English translation of a poem by Avram Sutzgiver, um, one of the most famous Yiddish poets of the second half of the 20th century. Um, and I think what I'll do, I'll, I'll read the English and then I'm gonna read the, the end in Yiddish after so that we can end with the, with the Yiddish and you'll see the, the themes of translation and why this is a, a hard poem to read in translation. Yiddish, and it's translated by Barbara and Benjamin Harshav. Yiddish, shall I start from the beginning? Shall I, a brother like Abraham, smash all the idols? Shall I let myself be translated alive? Shall I plant my tongue and wait till it transforms into our forefathers, raisins and almonds? What kind of joke preaches my poetry brother with whiskers that soon my mother tongue will set forever? A hundred years from now, we may still sit here on the Jordan and carry on this argument. For a question gnaws and paws at me if he knows exactly in what regions, Levi Yitzhak's prayer, Yehayash's poem, Kulbach's song, are straying to their sunset, could he please show me where the language will go down? Maybe at the Wailing Wall. If so, I shall come there, come, open my mouth, and like a lion garbed in fiery scarlet, I shall swallow the language as it sets and wake all the generations with my roar. Oh, that's fantastic. Okay, a bit a bit Yiddish. Tozol er mir a steiger, anweisen, wohin die Sprach geht unter? Efsche bei dem Kossel Marovi, bei Bazoi, will ich dort kommen, kommen, öffnen das Meul und wir leib, ungeton in feildicken Sunter, Einschlingen den Laschen, was geht unter, Einschlingen und alle Deueres wecken mit meinen Brummen. Brummen. Beautiful. Love it. Roar. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Love the sounds of the Yiddish. It's, 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 it's so much a, a piece of fabric of the New York. Mm. You know, it's just, you hear it is, I, I mean, I hear New York. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I love that. I love that it's, it's a part of different territories in as much as it is a stateless language or a language of exile, that it is still, it's so strongly tied to different locations. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I have a question for you about that, um, Mindel, and it, it's, um, it's a perfect segue from the poem who talks about, the poet talks about his, he'll speak his language as it's setting. And your, in combination with your comments earlier about the importance of translating the works, important works into Yiddish to, to create the Yiddish culture, um, you know, by the Jews in the, in the diaspora in 18 and early 1900s. How much today is being translated into Yiddish and does the Yiddish Book Center have um, a focus on that at all? That's really interesting, yeah. The, the center's focus is certainly translating from Yiddish into English. Um, there is some translation happening into Yiddish. One of the interesting things that happens is we get contacted by like various state boards in New York that need to translate official mm -hmm. documents into Yiddish, you know, for the Hasidic community. So there's a very important kind of state function, interestingly, of 
translating into Yiddish still for, for communities. Um, and there are some, some projects, a, a colleague of mine translated Dr. Seuss into Yiddish and like um, the cat in the hat in Yiddish is available and, and quite popular. And there continue to be projects like that um, for children's literature, probably as a way that, you know, to bring Yiddish into people's homes. Um, and, and otherwise, I'm sure it exists not quite in the same way, right? Because it did, translating into Yiddish was a really important part of building Yiddish as a, as a cultural language, right? And that's true for many languages. If you can translate Shakespeare into Yiddish, it means that Yiddish is as eloquent a language as, as English. And I think that that drive probably remains, um, though I don't know of any very recent, actually I do know, I, I know somebody who just translated Shakespeare into Yiddish this summer. So mm -hmm. I think that drive continues, yeah. Is your answer. Um, we had one question that came in from a viewer that um, it has a, a rather long preamble, which because of we're short on time, um, I'm going to abbreviate um, this person teaches um, both English and French in Louisiana. And they're describing um, the sort of French speakers of the state trying to reclaim the territory politically. So sort of on our own uh, turf here. Um, the question is, I'm wondering how, and this is really to any of you, I'm wondering how you might consider whether we will ever be able to convince America, particularly in this xenophobic era, in the larger American society to engage in the learning of languages other than English, stateless languages or not, by expressing the pleasure and delight of learning languages that open other parts of the world to them. If so, how best do we engage this American culture to show them the delights in tearing down walls, not building them at borders? I mean, I think this, you've all sort of spoken to this in terms of your own engagement with these languages, but um, I just wonder if you have any, what your, if you have a response to this viewer. Well, translation is one of the ways. I mean, I, my, um, my, I began to study Spanish language literature because I found a hundred years of solitude in a bookstore. And, um, you know, I think that's one of the things that translation does. If, if the Catalan texts and the Yiddish texts aren't in English and, and God knows if the Frisian texts were in English, at least people could conceivably uh, take an interest in it. But I think, uh, you know, in the, in the US, the US has a problem just learning Spanish, never, not the, the lesser known languages uh, are a next step for sure. But the interesting thing about Catalan is that the, its relationship to Spanish in the United States is very close. And most people, I would say 95% of people who, begin to study Catalan, come to it through a Spanish department, through having studied Spanish. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's, a, there's an interesting um, relationship there. I wonder sort of, Latasha, the way that you, um, ha the way that Frisian came to you actually. So, I mean, I just wonder, since you already had so many, you know, your, your work was already multilingual, is there, I don't I mean, know. Well, you know, the, the, the one thing, you know, I, I'm thinking about the, the, the two weeks that I was there, you know, once I learned that there was this language and wanted to hear it, um, the, the, the question of who will speak it to me, right? Um, and, and, um, and, you know, one thing to, you know, to, to, to make sure that it's, that it's understood, that there was a Frisian movement in the 1950s, which allowed the Frisian language to be uh, government funded, to be officially recognized as a second language, um, to be taught in primary schools uh, and um, certain courses in secondary education. Um, and then beyond that, I think there are those who are invested in preserving the language, but then how they're preserving the language and how they're furthering the interest and curiosity is what I, I felt that I was um, hit with a wall. Um, 
And, and the reason why I say that, and I, I guess I'm going to try to connect it to this, uh, how do we make Americans multilingual or, uh, or to be just as giddy about different languages as we are. Uh, very simply, there needs to be some fun. <laughs> There needs to be some fun. We, uh, a, you know, to encounter folks and understand that Frisian is, though it's not necessarily spoken in Leavaden, but it's spoken in the towns outside of Leavaden, which were part of Friesland, um, uh, and that it's now, while it's spoken in the courts, and while you can have someone and you have a Bible that's been translated into uh, Frisian, how, how do we make, how do we invite younger, the younger generation um, to be engaged with it, to have an interest in it? Um, Dr. Seuss. Dr. Seuss is Dr. The, I mean, yeah, <laughs> I, I totally agree. Dr. Seuss <laughs> is the one. Um, uh, but then after Dr. Seuss, you know, I mean, like we could we can continue to read Dr. Seuss because we like Dr. Seuss, but most most folks will grow out of Dr. Seuss. Oh, so yeah. then are there graphic novels? Mm -hmm written in other languages? Are there, are there augmented reality um, projects that involve other languages um, that will spark a curiosity? Um, I know we had a, a earlier conversation about how, how, how few people are interested in learning a language and are only interested in learning the swear words. Mm -hmm. and, and I said, I'm probably one of those people <laughs> who, love, who love learning the swear words and um, because they become a secret language, right? You know, they become- when I taught, when I was teaching language, I always taught the swear words. <laughs> <laughs> they become a secret language. Mm -hmm. I'm crazy, I'm the curmudgeon. Uh, <laughs> you know, and, and, and that's, that's um, you know, growing up in New York and growing up, you know, uh, with uh, Dominicans and Puerto Ricans as my classmates, you know, there was, it was wonderful to learn the word puta, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> and bendejo, <laughs> you know, and, you know, and you could say it. Um, but but then it became universally known in New York, right? Because you know, you New York is unique in that where you you did know, and you didn't know how you didn't have to know Spanish to know what bendejo meant, right? <laughs> you knew it was something bad. Um, yeah. Yiddish is like Yiddish too. I think Yiddish too. Yeah, you know. Um, uh, we have to introduce those Catalan words. That's it. <laughs> yeah, we have to introduce them. We have to introduce them. Um, I'm sorry we're out of time because we're getting the conversation as we start talking about swear words it's getting more and more scary <laughs> <laughs> but uh, thank all thank you all Mindel, Latasha and Marianne for contributing to the conversation today and uh, once again we would like to thank our partners HowlRound, PEN America, the Center for the Humanities at the Graduate Center, CUNY, the Coleman Center for Scholars and Writers at the New York Public Library, the Martin E. Siegel Theater Center, and deep gratitude to the Yiddish Book Center and the Institute Amanuel for their support of today's event. Thank you again, and we hope to see you next week. Thank all of you. Bye.